In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, today is Election Day. First, I want to speak about that just briefly. Whatever happens, let's keep firmly in mind that, one, God has permitted it. Nothing can happen in this world without His permission. Or, nothing can happen in this world without His directly willing it. Thus, the saints always viewed all things, even the most distasteful, as coming from the hand of God for their own good. So one of the psalm verses reads, You humbled me, O God, that I might learn your law. And so if we're humbled, it's so that we will learn God's law anew. Second of all, we are wayfarers here. We're pilgrims. So we say, this too shall pass. No matter what happens, we say to ourselves, this too shall, shall pass. And I too shall pass from this life. Let's not get so carried away that we get depressed and lose our peace over something that is passing. The church has existed under every kind of extreme situation, every sort of government or that lack thereof. She's always passed through it, and she will pass through this too. Third of all, our idea of victory or loss may not be the correct one. We do not know what the future holds. The person we think may be the best may be the worst. The king we do know will return someday, thank God. He will return and his church will triumph. So I encourage you, don't lose your peace, whatever happens. Now, during the octave of all saints... Holy Mother Church encourages the daily Mass of the dead. Is what we're saying today, tomorrow, and the next day. The church wants to increase the number of her saints in heaven, so she no sooner than celebrates all saints, and she says, get those souls out of purgatory. Work on it. So the octave of all saints is all about the poor souls. Isn't that interesting? So these next few days, we'll try to give you a few thoughts on purgatory. Now, today's will be the longest of all the sermons. Purgatory. Sometimes I like to say it, purgatory. Going to purge out all those sins. But sadly today, let's face it, from the behavior and speech of many Catholics, one would think that we no longer have to believe in purgatory, Right? Some think it is just an idea that goes back to the Middle Ages. Someone back there thought it up in those hard, dark times. When in fact, they were probably some of the best times the world has ever seen. Some think it is just an idea then, just made up. So today, everyone seems to go straight to heaven. Cardinal Ratzinger in the Ratzinger Report once said, the fact is that all of us today think we are so good that we deserve nothing less than heaven. Why is this now? One of the reasons is because is we're living in a time in which everybody thinks they're a victim. I'm a victim. All the bad things that have happened to me in my life, that's not my fault. It's because of my upbringing. It was because of this. It was because of that. We're victims, so we don't deserve any punishment. Even these kinds of thoughts, they need to be purged. That's why there's a purgatory. Because they're wrong. I know a priest, a good priest, God rest his soul, who had arranged many masses to be said for himself after death, including no less than two Gregorian masses. Why? Because he knew the climate of the church today, that hardly anyone would be praying for him when he died. He planned ahead. He knew he would need them where he was going. Now, maybe he got a little carried away, but on the same token, the thought is that no one's praying for the souls in purgatory. You know, I feel sorry for the nuns who die, especially in, in some of these convents that are pretty holy, are striving for holiness. 
Everybody thinks they go to heaven and no one pay, prays for a nun that dies. Poor things, they're probably all in purgatory. St. Teresa said of all the nuns she knew, only two went to, pur- went to heaven. All of them went to purgatory that she knew of. And they were holier back then than they are now. Well, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So faith and reason tell us that there's a middle ground of expiation where the soul is cleansed from all stain of sin before entering into the glory of heaven. Purgatory is then both scriptural and traditional and reasonable. Let's look at our faith. Let's concentrate there. Scriptural, we know that we could talk about that for some time. It's the penny that must be paid, the last penny, the last farthing. It won't be let it out of the prison. St. Paul talks about a purifying fire. But let's talk about the f- tradition. Council of Florence, Council of Lyon, and most especially the Council of Trent have said in clear language, there is a purgatory. And it's based upon Scripture and the Father's. Listen to the Council of Trent. This is the 25th session. I don't know about you, but when I hear these statements, it's just like, it's like playing on a harp in my soul. It's just beautiful. Like it's, I could read it over and over again. It's like, ah, oh, so nice. I don't have to rely, re- rely on my own judgment. I can rely on God. He tells me what is true with assurance through his holy church. Are we thankful for this? Thank you, God. I don't have to beat my head against the wall trying to figure things out. Here's what he says through his holy church. The Catholic Church instructed by the Holy Ghost in conformity with the sacred scriptures and the ancient tradition of the fathers and sacred councils and very recently in this ecumenical council has taught that there is a purgatory. There is a purgatory. And that the souls detained there assisted by are assisted by the suffrages of the faithful and especially by the acceptable sacrifice of the altar. Well, let's look at some of the fathers they're speaking of. St. Cyprian. He was around the year 200 AD, so he's a pretty early father. Here's what he says. It is one thing to receive the reward of heaven immediately and quite another thing to be thrown into the prison and not come out until the last farthing has been paid. It is one thing to have done away with all sin here on earth by our martyrdom, and quite another to be purified of our sins in the hereafter by a lengthy time of suffering. Now, he didn't use the word purgatory, but he's talking about it. Lengthy time of suffering. Now, I want you to know something. When you go to purgatory... You get no merit for that. You don't increase your charity. You don't increase your place in heaven. All that suffering there does not bring glory to God. But all your suffering here does. All your suffering here increases the size of your vessel. You can receive more of God when you die. If you do it for the love of Him. Let's make it count. Let's make it count. Let's listen to St. Gregory the Great. He says, Each one will be presented to the judge exactly as he was when he departed this life. Yet there must be a cleansing fire before judgment because of faults that may remain to be purged away. St. Gregory. St. Augustine. That cleansing fire is thought, of, thought lightly of Yet the fire be more grievous, that fire be more grievous than anything that man can suffer in this life whatsoever. So clearly, from this discussion, it follows that there truly is a purgatory. Thank God. Thank you, Lord. We need it. Because if there weren't there, only a small fraction of mankind would be saved, only those that would go straight to heaven. Because the justice of God would be so terrible, it is too terrible, such that few would make it to heaven. If there were no middle state, even those with slight imperfections would have to be rejected. 
And many canonized saints have tried to have others pray for them because they said, look, I'm going to purgatory. Padre Pio said he was going to purgatory. After 50 years of the stigmata, he considered that I was going to purgatory. St. Teresa of Jesus, the great Carmelite mystic, I'm going to purgatory, pray for me. None of the saints thought they were going straight to heaven. How many of us think we're always going straight to heaven? So let us do all we can to avoid this place. We do not have to go there. And I want to repeat again how much our sufferings count here on earth. They count. Let's make them count. The more we suffer for the love of God, the bigger our vessel becomes. The more our faults are purged away, the higher our place in heaven. St. Teresa of Jesus, great Carmelite mystic, said she would suffer unto the end of the world, even through our times. Can you imagine that? And she knew what she was saying. She saw our times. She said she would suffer until the end of the world to gain one degree of glory in heaven. So wonderful is that one degree. Something to think about. We are still in our bodies. We can gain a degree of glory by embracing the daily duties of our life and suffering what God deems to send us and even taking up extra. Let us avoid the fire by burning all the fuel in our souls now while we're in this life. And so when, when we die, there'll be nothing to burn and we'll be on fire for love of God. Become a saint. God wants it. The church wants it, and you will want it. St. Ephraim says, I beseech you, my dear brethren and friends, in the name of God who commands me to leave you, to remember me when you assemble to pray. Do not bury me with perfumes. Give them, give them not to me, but to God. Me, conceived in sorrows, bury with lamentations. But instead of perfumes, assist me with your prayers. For the dead are benefited by the prayers of the living saints. Let us continue to pray for the faithful departed, especially at the Holy Mass, and having Masses offered for them. During the next few days, until November 8th, if we visit a cemetery and offer prayers for the dead, even mentally, we can earn a plenary indulgence for the poor souls with all the normal stipulations, prayers for the Holy Father, detachment from sin, confession, and communion within eight days. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. And may their souls and all the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen.